chiropractic education needs to be within the university. Um, individuals who know what they don't know. And they were actually saying, oh, apply to medicine, it's easier. So, Jean, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to uh, do this interview. Um, could you give us a brief introduction as to your story and, and how you, your, your progression through the chiropractic career? Uh, well, it's, it's, I'm not so sure it's a short story, but um, I originally started with the very first class at the Anglo-European College in Bournemouth. Um, and then because of the strike that happened there during our second year, a group of us uh, transferred to the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College after we had been blacklisted by the Anglo-European College across North America. Uh, but um, uh, the dean at CMCC was thought that it was interesting to have us students, and particularly as they were in financial trouble at the point, at that point, and ten fee-paying students, I guess, looked uh, looked uh, pretty good to them. And uh, Dr. Holmwood accepted us on sort of probation, and we went on from there. When I graduated from CMCC, I started in the clinic. I graduated in May, and I started in the clinic the following January, and. And then after some time in Europe, I went back and started to work full time at the college, gradually became involved in a number of different administrative positions throughout the institution, teaching positions. And um, in 1991, I became executive uh, vice president to Ian Coulter. And when he went on sabbatical, I became the acting president in 1991. I was appointed as the, the president. And uh, I stayed there until 2014. And had a very illustrious time there, I'm, I remember. Um, so th that's given you, um, you've seen a lot of students through the program. You've seen a lot of chiropractors. You've known a lot of chiropractors. What do you consider of the um, attributes that make for a good chiropractor? What are you looking, what would you be looking for um, uh, as something your students get when they graduate? Um, uh, we would, um, for a good chiropractor, I think what you're looking for is you're looking, first of all, somebody that comes into the program because it's a tough program it's not that the material is so tough but there's a lot of material and students have to be um they have to be really good students in order to succeed in the program um and so i think first of all you need students that do have a good educational background Secondly, um, I think you need individuals that are empathetic with their, with their patients, that, that can communicate well with their patients, and also with other health practitioners because um, referral becomes an important part of your practice. Um, I think you're looking for lifelong learners um, because you want them to continue to keep up with research. Uh, you want them to be aware of guidelines as they come out and to incorporate those guidelines into their practice. Um, hopefully, they will be interested in research, but obviously not all chiropractors are going to be interested in research, but either interested in research in really getting involved in research or, you know, being involved in research that they can do from their own practice. I think those are the, the things that you're really looking for in a practitioner. And perhaps one of the things is um, individuals who know what they don't know. So that um, they can, um, they, they look at their patients, they look at them very carefully, they look at what they can treat, what they can't treat, what they might try to treat for a limited period of time, but certainly not people that are going to start treating things that there's really no basis for them to be treating at all. So understanding the evidence base, even if uh, you haven't necessarily contributed to it, but understanding what the evidence base is for the things that we do. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And also understanding that evidence base also includes their own clinical experience. I think sometimes that gets for, forgotten, but it, it's, it's got to be good clinical experience, not some of the wild claims that we see. Right. Well, that was one of the tenets, of course, of Sackett, wasn't it? That uh, the clinician's experience or preference was a key element of evidence-based mm -hmm. practice. So. Um, so what do you think the future holds for chiropractic education? Now, in, in this country, in the UK, we're increasingly trying to recruit universities to run programs because we see that as a model which is helpful here. Do you think that's something which could happen in North America or do you think that's something which is unlikely to be the case? In which case, where do you think new programs are going to come from if you need any new programs? Well, I, I, I think that chiropractic education needs to be within the university. Obviously, I spent a great deal of my time at CMCC um, trying to work with university affiliation. Ultimately, we got our own degree granting, which is certainly a step in the right direction. Um, but I'm not sure that that's the real answer. I truly believe that chiropractors, all health professionals should be educated in a, in a similar environment, sharing some courses. Um, I think that gives them a better clarity and a better idea of how other health professionals work. Um, it enables making contacts. It, it, remove some of the mystery about different health professions. So I think that the model that you're using in, in Europe is by, by far the best. And that's what I would like to see um, around the world. Um, what do I think? I know that what's happened in, in um, the US is that some of the, the colleges, chiropractic colleges have become universities. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that that's the answer. I think they still become fairly um, proprietary. Um, but I guess that, that again is for them a step in the right direction. Um, I think it's important that we bring in good students, um, not just good students in the sense of academics with high marks, although that's a very important part. But also, we've always had at CMCC a, a process of interviewing students, and I still firmly believe that that gives you some insight into the character, into the way the individual is likely to develop. Um, I believe that a strong admissions process is a very important part of the development of an educational program, um, especially one like chiropractic. Uh, we've always, we were always fortunate in CMCC in that we have had a, a limited enrollment since about the mid seventies. So we always had a waiting list for students. The idea that you can accept almost everybody that applies, I, I don't think you're getting really the types of students that you necessarily want. I don't think it's, it's fair to the institution and I don't think it's fair to the students. Um, it's, it's not fair to ask students to spend large amounts of money on their education if they're really not equipped to deal with the course that they're going to be working in. So um, I mean, that leads on to the sort of thought process. I mean, in Canada, you've got a higher awareness of chiropractic and how chiropractic uh, is part of the system or part of the healthcare op um, offer. Um, in this country, we're starting to build um, our reputation and build numbers, but there still are um, the, the recognition for chiropractors and certainly the take up for chiropractic care is quite low. What do you think um, are the options for the situation like we've got when we've got a, a, a course starting in somewhere like Teesside, where there aren't that many chiropractors, the recognition of chiropractic is not very great. What are the things we can do to try and stimulate that, to make more interest for the students um, in, in going to that, that institution? Well, obviously, it's the reputation of the profession itself. Um, one of my observations, and this is purely anecdotal, um, over the years at CMCC, because I was there for 
45 years um, overall uh, was that as the reputation of the profession um, improved, then different ethnic groups became part of um, the institution. Um, at first, it was very what you would call waspy, white Anglo-Saxon. Um, uh, then um, we began to get a lot of Jewish students. And, you know, we gradually progressed through some more immigrant students from immigrant backgrounds. And, um, and so now there's a broad spectrum of students there. But it was, to me, it always seemed that it was associated to the reputation of the profession. If, if students were gonna go into a profession like this, then their parents and the students themselves wanted to feel that they were getting into something with a strong reputation. Many of the students that come in have actually been to chiropractors and have had successful treatment and, and that stimulates them to, to apply. Um, I think the reputation of the institution is extremely important. And that's hard when you're starting off with a new, um, with a new institution. One of the things, um, as I said, we've, we've always been lucky in having um, more students apply than we could take. Uh, but one time we decided to go out and, and talk. And, and when we were looking at our, our admissions program and, and talk to some of the profs in universities, particularly those that would be in kinesiology and subjects like that, that would where we knew that we were getting quite a few students from. And the interesting thing was that what we found was that we had such a reputation that they said, oh, they were telling their students, oh, don't bother to apply there, you'll never get in there. It's too hard. <laughs> And they were actually saying, oh, apply to medicine, it's easier, which really <laughs> blew us away. Mm. And um, it's not that we, we lacked applicants, but it's obvious that some people were being discouraged by the profs that were telling them this. But it, in a way, it was a good thing because it meant that they were recognizing that you had to be a good student in order to get into the program. So the and, and so that <laughs> builds over time, you know? Um, and and I, I I think that we always come back to this dichotomy in the profession that if we're not going to follow an evidence-based course as a profession um, and we're going to start making claims like the one that I most recently heard that we could cure COVID-19 um, with absolutely no evidence whatsoever, then that undermines everything. It undermines everything for us. It undermines respect for the profession. It undermines students becoming involved in research. It, and, and to me, if I looked back when I, when I finally retired from CMCC, the one thing that frustrated me the most was that that had not changed despite my efforts and many other people's efforts, but that dichotomy in the profession had not changed. And the so arguments were the same as they were 50 years before. So we're, we've sort of been standing at a crossroads for quite a long time, haven't we, with, the, with, with one direction which might be termed the evidence base and the other um, which might be, um, if you like, anecdotal or um, writing their own story rather than following the evidence. Um, what do you think is going to happen now over the next decade or even two decades? Where do you think we're going to go? Do you think we're going to resolve this or do you think it's just going to remain an issue? Uh, and if that is the case, are we going to be finding it very difficult as a profession to move forward? I am hopeful that it will be resolved. And since I've been involved in Oh, I can't even count how many times looking at the identity of the profession. And we always come out the same way that the profession thinks it's X and our patients think we're Y. Um, I think that the evidence-based way to go is the only way. Not only does it provide the best treatment for our patients, um, but as far as um, Pay, payers 
insurance companies, governments, you know, healthcare is extraordinarily expensive in general, and they are not going to pay for services that can't be backed up by research. Yeah. So if we, and, and I, sorry, if we increase the number of courses that are effectively evidence-based and increase the number of students going through who understand the need for an evidence base, that should presumably help us with regard to the body of students, or the body of chiropractors uh, in, in increasingly feeling that the evidence-based route is the right one. Do you think that'll happen? Or do you think we are still, too many of them are seduced into the opposite camp once they get into practice? I, I think unfortunately, um, that too much of the, I think it's to do with expectations of the young graduates. They often have very high expectations of what they're going to earn as a chiropractor right off the bat, uh, not understanding. And perhaps this is something that you see not in just in chiropractic, but in other fields as well. You even see it in academia, to be honest. Um, people just don't seem to understand that you kind of pay your dues, you kind of build up to things uh, in the same way that people used to. And so I think that they get attracted to individuals that offer them the carrot, which is a lot of money, um, using their particular practice building methods. I think this has done more harm to the profession than anything else. Yeah. And unfortunately, you still see students who you never would have dreamt would have been interested in something like the practice building gurus go that way once they've been in practice for a while and, and I guess their expectations aren't being met. And I remember having um, an interesting conversation one time um, with somebody that's sort of not so much on the evidence-based side of things and, and his institution was having exactly the same problem and he didn't understand it either. So I thought that was an interesting <laughs> anecdote. Uh, but I think that's a real problem. I mean, I don't know what we do about it. I mean, I've heard all sorts of um, potential resolutions, the one that keeps coming back, well, we have two professions. Well, I think that is just something that's completely unworkable. Um, well, because, um, who has the name and, and, and where do exactly. we go with regard to regulation? And yeah, that's a, uh, well, it, I, mean, it, I mean, it's incredibly difficult to see how you could manage that. No, I, I just can't see how that could ever work. Perhaps, and, COVID, perhaps COVID might change uh, some people's view on the need for, lots of money. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll come out of this pandemic with a slightly different view on that. But maybe well, I mean, that, that would be good. I mean, I think one of the other things that we have to look at is the cost of education, cost of chiropractic education. Um, particularly in, in the institutions that are not associated to universities. I, I'm not sure what the costs are in Europe, but the costs in, in, in North America are, are high. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens to enrollments after the pandemic where people have not had jobs, their parents haven't had jobs and perhaps don't have all the, you know, nobody expected this to happen. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens, whether they, they are able to still come and take the yes. positions they've been offered. Well, we'll wait and see, won't we? But let's hope. Um, going back to CMCC, what do you think are the strengths of that institution in particular? What are the things that it excels at? Um, I think we offered a very good educational program. Um, the fact that the Ontario government came in and and reviewed what we did and, and actually gave us um, degree granting rights for a 10 year period when their own act said that five was kind of the limit, um, <laughs> was a very good uh, indication that way. I think the other thing is that we always poured our money back into the program wherever we could um, and into research. We have always, we always had a very strong research program 
Um, we developed a postgraduate program, what we called our residency program, which has developed some of the some of the most influential researchers in 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 North America. Um, and there was a point where um, we had had a number of grants from NIH and they would actually call one of one of my researchers and sort of say, well, there's a grant coming up that I think you might be interested in and that sort of thing. And obviously we were outside of the United States. So that was very good. Some significant recognition for the quality of the research. So uh, one of the things that is cropping up now as we get more institutions this side of the Atlantic um, starting is academic staff and how you find good quality people to teach. And uh, obviously people, there are people who are interested in being academics and people who are interested in research, but they're not necessarily teachers. They may be people who want to get involved in the um, intellectual development of the profession, but not necessarily in teaching students. What do you think is the role of uh, an organization like CMCC in stimulating young people to think about teaching as a career as opposed to just going into practice? Well, I think that one of the ways we did it was with the residency program. Was that was a, a two year program or a three year program for radiology, um, which was particularly slanted towards those students being involved in, in research, but also to those to improving their clinical skills and giving them higher clinical skills. Um, many of those students that went through that program went on to do graduate degrees, and they also went, the, the, many of them are on faculty at CMCC. The other thing we did, because, um, you know, it's not easy to be a teacher, particularly in this day and age. Mm. It's all very different. Uh, we established a, a, a course for teachers, for teaching um, within, or should I say educating, within, within um, CMCC and all new faculty had to go through that program um, to try and deal with this because I think one of the things that always used to amuse me was that, you know, a chiropractor would decide, a prominent chiropractor would decide that they would, they were going to retire and, and that they were going to very generously give their time to CMCC to teach. And, you know, I, I'd be in the position of saying, well, I'm sorry, but really you don't have the qualifications to be here. And of course, ending up with some very offended people. Um, but but you know that it's not easy to teach but if you're going to teach then you really do need to be involved in research and and I think even today not enough of the chiropractic faculty are are involved in research I mean not everybody is going to do it um, but being involved of in it means that you stay at the forefront of it. You can provide your students with better information. And um, hopefully they're seeing a model there that they can look at, that they can take forward. Because one of the biggest problems that I see, I mean, I still sit on the Canadian um, Guideline Steering Committee. It's, it's developing something like guidelines and then getting the profession to actually adopt them and use them in their office. Yeah. You can spend all this money, you can do all this work, but if nobody uses them, it doesn't mean anything. Now that's the biggest dilemma we have at NICE here in the UK, um, is, is the implementation. It's, it's relatively easy to draw up guidelines. Um, it's very much more difficult to get them implemented. Um, and that's a very, it's a very thorny issue. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, clinicians that have been in the field for a long time, don't really want to change the way they do things, even if it might be better. Um, sometimes we find that the younger graduates going out and working with older practitioners manage to work small miracles, <laughs> but that's not always the case. Well, I, and I think this COVID thing will change some of that because we're all having, in the UK certainly, to learn a different way of practicing in order to be safe in the current environment. And that's actually meaning that we're having to focus in on what matters 
um, and, uh, and how to deliver it effectively um, so that the patient encounter delivers the best thing for the patient. And that's quite an interesting exercise for a lot of chiropractors are starting to reassess how they practice from that point of view, which is very good. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And we've only just uh, last week started, chiropractic offices have started, not last week, the week before, yeah. uh, have started to open or been allowed to open again. So we don't quite know how that's going to work yet. It'll be interesting to see what happens. One thing is for sure that they're having to space their patients more. Space the patients not, more, not just time-wise, but also within the building. It's, uh, that's right. Yeah. So volumes will inevitably be down and therefore um, the practice has to be more efficient and more effective to make it commercially viable. It's quite an interesting dilemma for people. Yeah, it is. And I, I think that one of the things I was talking to a couple of chiropractors the other day and, you know, they have gyms within their practice to show patients exercises and to allow patients to do that sort of thing. And I, I don't mean a full gym. I mean, just a, you know, a re, let's call it a rehab area in within their practice. And, uh, you know, they're wondering how they're going to manage this in the future. How are they, you know, is this going to be possible? So somebody that might have a large amount of space that they're renting may now have a large amount of space as part of that that they're not going to be able to use or they're going to be able to use differently. And so do they need it? Can they reduce their expenses by reducing the amount of space they rent? Well, there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to have to address as a profession and, and individuals are going to have to change a lot of their practices, I think. Um, that's very interesting. Is there anything else you'd like to explore that is uh, an issue that you think is important that we haven't covered? No, I think we've covered pretty well everything. I think my biggest, my biggest issue is the, the profession circling the wagons and shooting inwards. Well, that's... I've seen that again and again and again in all sorts of areas and particularly when it's it's done in a public environment um, in the United States when the Council on Chiropractic Education was being faced by major problems from people within the profession that was being taken to the Department of Education that sort of thing doesn't do anything for anybody and actually there's quite a lot of uh issues arising in the United States at the moment between the ICA and the ACA, I understand. Um, th th there's quite a lot of uh, animosity still. Well, that doesn't surprise me. I'm a bit out of the link as far as that goes these days. But um, it, 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 it has always been there. And, and what always amazes me is how few chiropractors actually belong to both of those organizations. Yeah. They make a lot of noise, but they don't represent a huge number of people. No, I mean, the last numbers I heard that combined, they only represented about 8,000 people. I have no idea where it is right now. No. But well, the, the, and when you consider there's, what, 60 or 70,000 chiropractors in the U.S., yeah. that's, that's not even a reasonable representation. No, no, not at all. Well, Jean, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, very useful and interesting. And um, I'm sure that uh, it'll, it'll form part of a very interesting... Uh, archive for us. <laughs>